Hey everybody, it's Mr. Matthew here again. In this video, we're gonna talk about how errors in meiosis affect chromosomes and can cause some disorders. Uh, and so in this case, we're gonna talk about the concept of non-disjunction, and I will give a handful of common conditions that are associated with non-disjunction in the formation of one of the gametes that led to that individual. Uh, and then lastly, I will talk about how karyotypes are used in diagnosing whether or not uh, you in fact have had non-disjunction leading to an individual. We can also just talk about karyotypes in general and how they're used to analyze chromosomes. All right, here we go. So what we see in non-disjunction is, non-disjunction is the failure of one or more pairs of homologous chromosomes or sister chromatids to separate normally during nuclear division, usually resulting in an abnormal number of chromosomes in the daughter nuclei. Pretty generic definition we have here, but I want to parse it out a little bit here. First, let's talk about the differences in here. Non-disjunction, the failure of one or more pairs of homologous chromosomes. So up in this particular uh, diagram, what you can see here is a difference between normal proper disjunction shown with this blue and green sister chromatids being pulled apart. And then down below, we see non-disjunction that's occurring. And in non-disjunction, the pairs of sister chromatids are being pulled together. So now I'm going to ha have you pause and think here. Is this diagram showing you the events of meiosis 1 or in meiosis 2? Pause and think. All right, so hopefully what you came up with is you were like, wait a minute, the sister chromatids are being separated, and that's not an event of, of a meiosis 1, so it has to be happening in meiosis 2. And now, yes, it's true, it doesn't tell you that this is metaphase 2 and anaphase 2, but in fact, that's what it would be. So when we look back to our definition, it talks about how homologous chromosomes can fail to separate or sister chromatids. It's important to note that non-disjunction can happen either during the first phase of the formation of gametes, meaning during meiosis 1, where the homologous chromosomes get pulled together over to one side. Um, that would end up leading to half of the daughter cells having oh, an extra chromosome in the end and half of them having too few. So if you think about in the case of humans, we would end up having 47 chromosomes in two of the gametes and 45 in the others. Or it can happen, as we see here in meiosis 2, in which case you would produce two gametes that would have the normal 46 chromosomes and two that would be um, a different number, one that would have one too many and one that would have one, uh, one too few. So non-disjunction applies to both conditions, whether it's meiosis 1 or meiosis 2. I also want to show you this instance here. And this particular instance shows you what happens. And so this diagram has um, meiosis happening on the left and on the right, representing the two separate parents. Now, there is a slight problem with this, and the slight problem being that uh, what we, in fact, are having here is we're just showing the sex chromosomes uh, in this case. So um, I do want to make that point. And a second issue with this is that it's showing that the female is producing four gametes when, in fact, the eggs, there's only one egg that's produced and then three polar bodies. So a couple little bit of issues here, not showing all the chromosomes, just the sex chromosomes, and then showing there. So in this particular instance, if I identify this individual on the left as a male, and I tell you that the red chromosome is going to be the X chromosome, and this greenish blue one is going to be the Y chromosome, now I want you to think about it. What would be the number of sex chromosomes in this individual. Pause and think. All right, so hopefully what you came up with is that this individual would be what's known as XYY. Y. Um, and in fact, that is one of the forms of non-disjunction disorders that we talk about. And generally speaking, there are five that we will discuss. And so the five that we will discuss um, that are going to be uh, here are going to be four associated with 
sex chromosomes. So first one would be Turner syndrome, and Turner syndrome is going to be having one X chromosome and no second sex chromosome. The second chromosome-related one that we have is Kleinfelter syndrome, and that indivi those individuals are XXY. The third is just the one that I showed you up here, which is XYY syndrome. And then the last uh, version is XXX syndrome. And so these are four common non-disjunction disorders. And I will point out that um, with all of these individuals, the, the science on how much of a syndrome this is or how much of a disorder is, is a point of debate. In the case of, of some of these, um, most individuals will have, you know, maybe slight deviations in development, often having an extra sex chromosome or one less sex chromosome will sometimes lead to slight differences in uh, sex hormone production. So you'll end up having a little bit more or a little bit less, say, testosterone in males that are XXY or XYY. Um, and so that can have some developmental issues. Also, individuals who have these conditions will oftentimes have some fertility issues. Those are the most prominent ones. Uh, some of the other conditions, uh, things like Turner syndrome, there are a few other notable health uh, effects that are seen in slightly higher incidence, but it's not appropriate to say everybody with Turner syndrome would have specific medical conditions. In many instances, you would not be able to know meeting somebody if they had Turner syndrome or Kleinfelter syndrome or XYY or XXX. It would just be an instance that those individuals might come upon a point, come, come upon a point oftentimes related to fertility or development where they might get tested and it reveals itself. The fifth uh, example that we use is a Down syndrome, which is trisomy 21. And in trisomy 21, uh, that means we have three number 21 chromosomes. And this is probably the most common disorder that we associate with non-disjunction or is produced as a result of non-disjunction and then fertilization. Now, the last point I'd like to make is that there are other forms of uh, trisomy that occur where extra chromosomes are put in, but these five are the conditions that are most compatible with survivability and life. Several of the other syndromes that are associated with this um, are associated with the failure to develop, failure to thrive, um, and in fact, many times these are lead to miscarriages. So you you'd have some extra research that you'd have to find to find something, say, like Patau syndrome, which is much rarer um, because uh, individuals don't survive to adulthood as a result of those conditions. All right, so how would somebody know that an individual ended up having too many or too few chromosomes? How do they go about doing this? Well, the way they actually go about doing it is they use something that is known as a karyotype, and a karyotype is literally a picture of the of the chromosome. So if we look at this image that I have highlighted in the middle, this is exactly what they do. They take the cells and they freeze them at a point where they are in early prophase. And so obviously they don't necessarily know this. They would take a bunch of cells that would be dividing and they freeze them and they go around and they look for cells that are in this late prophase where you can see the double chromatid chromosomes. And then what they do is they burst the cells open and they take a picture. And then they physically will cut out the pictures of the chromosomes and they will line them up. So the one that I show you in the middle is what you would be doing under the microscope to look at them. Uh, and then you take a picture of that, you'd cut them all out and then you'd line them up from largest to smallest chromosome. And so I have two uh, samples here, one on the left, which we'll call number one, and one on the right, which we'll call number two. And what I want you to do is I want you to pause and think. And I would like you to tell me what is going on with each of these two karyotypes? Karyotype number one and karyotype number two. I'd like you to make a diagnosis based off of these two karyotypes. Pause and think. All right, so let's look at number one first. Hopefully what you did is when you looked at this diagram, you took a peek and said, hey, look at that. It's got three number 21 chromosomes, and we just called that trisomy 21 or down syndrome. You'll also notice that this individual is XY. So this is a boy who has Down syndrome. All right. And then over here on the right, what you hopefully noticed was that there was only one sex chromosome. And so this individual has one X chromosome and no Y chromosome. So this individual has Turner syndrome. So there, there are your two diagnoses. Hopefully those were pretty straightforward. Uh, it is noteworthy in all of our um, 
examples, there's never been an instance where somebody has been born without an X chromosome. So having an X chromosome is crucial to survival, and that may be a useful thing to remember when talking about how are those genetic disorders? Is it an individual who's X or an individual Y? An individual who has a single X is a female, uh, has female secondary sex characteristics, but having just a Y is not compatible with survival. All right, so I hope that was a helpful review of meiotic errors and karyotyping, and I will talk to you soon.